Okay, so we're looking at a video again related to the completely randomized design experiments, but now we're going to be talking about multiple comparisons of the mean. What we're doing is we're discussing the consequence of rejecting the null hypothesis and doing the ANOVA procedure for a completely randomized design experiment. So these multiple comparison procedures that we're going to discuss um, come up whenever you reject the null hypothesis. So that's the first thing you need to know. If you don't reject HO, then there's no discussing this multiple comparison idea because the reason why we want to compare the means is this. If I should reject HO, if I throw that out and say it's not valid, that means I'm supporting HA. HA says that at least two of these means differ from one another significantly. So I can find at least two of them that are different from one another. Well, that would lead to the natural question, which two, for example? Or can you find that they're all different from one another? Or maybe two of them are different from the rest, or maybe one is different from all the rest, right? That's that's the whole idea, like, you know, which ones are different, right? That's what we want to know. So that's when we would have to do the multiple comparison procedure. If we don't reject each other, then we're saying they're all the same. Then we don't have to ask that question anymore, which ones are different. None of them are different. If you don't reject each other, you're basically saying you believe they're all the same. And in that case, there's no sense in trying to find a difference between them, right? But if you know that at least one of them is different from, different from another, then the question might be natural to say, hey, well, which ones, right? Okay, so this procedure, these procedures are designed to tell us that. And here's how they basically work. We basically choose two means at a time and compare them, and we see if they're different. It's very simple. Actually, we have a procedure for this. If we only had two means, we would just compare them, and we'd do a confidence interval, for example, for like x bar a minus x bar b. And if we did a confidence interval like that, and we saw that a was significantly different from b, we could then conclude that a is different from b, right? So, you know, we know how to do that for just a pair, but there's going to be multiple means here that have to be compared. That's the first thing we want to address here in this video is how many different comparisons must be made. Let's take this example out from the board. We have four means, right? Four different treatments, A, B, C, and D. So let's just note that that means that K is four, right? Remember, K is the number of treatments, so K here is four. Now, how many different comparisons would we have? Well, let's see. We'd have to compare A to B, right? Compare A and B. That would be one comparison. We have to compare A to C, see that those are different, right? That's the second comparison. A to D is three. Uh, we haven't compared B to C yet, so we'd have to do that. And then you have B to D, that's five. And then we'd have one more comparison, C compared to D, that gives us six different comparisons. What we like to do is make a connection, like how did that turn out to be six? Is that just coincidental here, or is there a, a pattern that we could observe in all cases? And there actually is a pattern. The pattern is this, you would take the number of treatments you have, right, or the number of treatment means, which is the same in this case, it's four. Let's just call it K to be abstract about it. It would be K treatment means, and you're going to choose them two at a time to compare, right? Choose two of them out of the set that you have to make comparisons. Choose here is also the notation you use for combinations, right? This is a concept from status one that you may or may not remember. Let me just show you how you work that out. If you work that out, you'd basically be saying that uh, it's k factorial on top, this guy on top factorial, the other one, this guy, on the bottom factorial. And then what you put here is you put the difference between these two items in here factorial. That's going to be k minus 2. That's basically how you set up the problem. Now, it turns out that factorial, if you have, for example, 2 factorial, what it means is you're going to do 2 times 1 less than 2, which is 1, and so on and so forth. But here we stop. Once you get to 1, you stop. So 2 times 1, for example, 2 factorial is just 2. All right, good. Now, what would it be if it was something like k factorial? Well, k factorial is actually going to be k times 1 less than k, that's k minus 1, times, the next thing would be this guy minus 1. So k minus 1 minus 1 and k minus 2, right? Dot, 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 dot. We can just put that as shorthand. This is saying that you can continue in that pattern, right? k minus 3, k minus 4, k minus 5. The reason why I'm stopping there is because I see, remember that 2 factorial is 2, but remember I'm stopping there because I see that this is here, right? So this k minus 2 factorial, that can cancel because we're dealing with a fraction that has all multiplication in it. So we can go ahead and cancel, in other words, we can divide off those two quantities. And what we're left with then essentially is this, right? We have k times k minus 1 over that's the formula. And so what you do essentially, you know, so you don't have to sit there and memorize this abstract formula, is just realize what this is saying. You take the number of treatments you have, right? 
you multiply by one less than that, and then you divide by two. So how many treatments did I have here? I had four. Multiply by one less than that, that's four times three, that's gonna give us 12. Divide that in half, you get the six that we came up with before. Okay, so that's how you determine how many comparisons need to be done. If that's asked in your course, you'll have that covered. Okay, now the next thing we wanna talk about is essentially what procedures are available to us. You may say, well, shouldn't it just be regular confidence intervals? Um, not actually, because what's going to happen is each confidence interval we would form, if we want to compare A and B, for example, so we did a confidence interval between the two X bars, right? Something we learned how to do earlier on. Um, if you did that kind of comparison here, the problem you run into is that you would have a certain confidence level, let's say 95% for that interval, and then the interval between A and C would have the same confidence level, let's say 95%, and then that one, so on and so forth. When you lump them all together, um, you'd end up having like a probability of at least one problem. I could explain it in detail, but that would chew a lot of time in our video. But essentially what's going to happen is your confidence level is a lot lower than it should be at the end for the overall set of intervals you've created. And so that, that becomes a problem, right? So in order to fix that, we have multiple comparison procedures that were developed by other statisticians, and those procedures have gained popularity. So there's three that are often talked about in elementary stats classes, and uh, let's talk about those first. We're going to have two keys method. We'll have another method called Bonferroni. These are obviously named after the mathematicians or statisticians who came up with them. So Tukey, Bonferroni, and then there's this guy, Chefe. And hopefully I'm not butchering this, the uh, pronunciation of his name, but it's Tukey, Bonferroni, and Chefe. So there's gonna be three major procedures that are often talked about in elementary stats classes. And you often find these also in software packages as well. Um, we're just going to give you a quick breakdown of how you should choose these procedures in general. So real quick, the two-key procedure is the best. In other words, it gives us the, the shortest intervals. It gives us the best intervals, the tightest intervals with the least margin of error. We like the two-key procedure then, and we can use it. The problem is it requires that the design of the experiment was balanced, right? So we have to have a balanced experiment. And we also should be just comparing, say, for example, A to B, A to C, A to D. We can't do anything more complicated than that. We can't say something like, you know, uh, B is twice as big as A. We can't do something more general, you know. We can compare A and B, but we can't do something like, you know, we think B is two times as big as A. We can't do that. Okay, so the two key procedure is, is limited in that regard, right? We have to make a simple comparison. There's two means compared, which is what we usually want to do anyway, so that's not too bad. But the other thing, though, is it has to have a balanced design. We have to have the same number of subjects in each treatment. So we go back at the data, you know, for example, they'd all have to have five subjects or 10 subjects or 11 subjects, right? You couldn't have one that has 10, another has nine, another has eight, another has 10. You can't have that. They'd have to all have the same number of subjects in order to use two key. But if we have those conditions, you should use the two key because it gives you the best results. After that, we have this Bonferroni procedure. A Bonferroni is nice because it does not require that it's a balanced design. In other words, we can have the scenario where they have different sample sizes. So if there's 10 here and 9 here, so if it's there, two keys off the table, can't use it. But Bonferroni is available then. And uh, it gives us the next best intervals. They're a little wider than the two key intervals, but they're still better than the third option. What's the only restriction on the Bonferroni? Again, you cannot do complicated comparisons. You can't do something like, again, C plus D is bigger than B. You can't do that. You can't do twice C is bigger than A. You can't do that. You can just compare A and B, or A and C, or A and D, or B and C, and D and B, so on and so forth. You can make simple comparisons between two means with one All right, so what's the advantage to the Chaffe? Well, it produces the widest intervals. It's not the best procedure in that regard, but it allows us to make more complicated comparisons, right? So I can compare, you know, uh, I can say that two, 2 times A is greater than B, or 2 times A is equal to B, or something. I can do uh, a more general comparison. They call that general contrast, general comparison. So with the Chaffe, you're allowed to get more complicated comparisons done, um, so that's the advantage to that. But it does produce the widest intervals, so in that sense, it's not the best choice if you're only going to make a simple comparison between, say, two means, right? If you have just two comparisons to be made, use two key and Bonferroni, right? So you're just comparing A to B in a simple comparison, see which one is bigger, and two key or Bonferroni is nice. And when I say two comparisons, I mean in pairs. In other words, you, you could do 20 comparisons, but they all have to be one mean compared to another, not uh, three means compared to one, or uh, the product of two of them compared to another, not like that, right? Okay, so either way, two key is the best choice, Bonferroni is second best, the difference between these, balanced design, 
you can use unbound design, chaffe, general contrast are allowed. That's why you would choose that. All right, and then finally, the last part of this video that we want to discuss is what exactly are we going to have to do? Because we're not going to be asked to calculate those in rules in general. Most elementary stats classes will give you computer output and you have to interpret the output. So what's entailed in that? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We've done it before. Um, let's say that a computer output gives you something like this. It says that you know the mean for A minus the mean for B. Let's say that it estimates that using a confidence interval. And the interval they give you is something like, I don't know, 7 to 10. If you get an interval like that, the question is, how would you interpret it? Well, what you do is you look at how the computer printout is displaying the difference. If it's showing it like this, it's saying they did A minus B. Now, let's think about this for a second. If you take a number here that's large, like 10, let's say, and you subtract a smaller number, like 3, the difference between 10 and 3 is positive because the number on the back end is smaller than the number on the front end. You know, 10 minus 3 gives you a positive 7. Compare that to this. What if you did instead, the opposite way around, what if it had been 3 minus 10? Then, of course, since the number on the back end is bigger, you end up with a negative 7. So what we're getting at here is that the sign of the difference is indicating which number was actually bigger. If this number here was bigger, right? that one turned out to be bigger, then what would happen is you would end up with positive, a positive interval. If this number is smaller, like in this case, you would end up with a negative interval. So that's really the whole key. That's the idea. Right? So essentially what we're saying is that when you see that both of the limits are positive like that, both limits are positive, it means that this guy is bigger than that guy. You can come along and say, hey, look, A is greater than B. We could do that. If the results were opposite of that, if we had you know the same numbers, let's say, but we had them you know, negative, so let's say we had negative 10 to negative 7, right? I had to switch them around because that's how the number line goes. This is actually the smaller number, right? All right, but negative 10 to negative 7, since they're both negative, it must indicate that this guy is actually the bigger one, and then you would be able to conclude that B is greater than A. And then finally, the last scenario is what? One's positive, one's negative. So maybe you have something like this. Now, if that's the case, then essentially what you can say is this. You can say, well, zero is inside that interval. And if zero is in the interval, it's quite possible that the true difference between these two is zero. Because this interval is what? The confidence interval? And we're saying that this difference between A and B lies somewhere in that interval. That's basically what our interval is trying to say, right? We think the true difference is somewhere between these two numbers. Well, zero is between those two numbers. And if that difference was zero, we'd be saying they were the same. That means that the mean for A and the mean for B are identical. And if that's the same, then the difference between them is zero it means they're equal. So there's always the possibility in that case that A is equal to B. However, it's just a possibility. So what we want to do is rather than say definitively they're, that they're, they are the fact the same, we're going to do one other thing. We're going to look at that interval on a number line. This is where a lot of people have trouble. We're going to look at it, though, and look at you know, where negative 10 is and where you know, positive 7 is. Let's say 7 is here. Negative 10 would be a little further over here. We have more negative space than positive space. Don't you agree? There's only 7 numbers here. There are 10 numbers here. So we'd say what? There's a little more negative than there is positive. So it's the same kind of thing. We'd say, well, if it's a little more negative, that means the back number was probably bigger when they did the subtraction, right? It wasn't significantly bigger, but it was bigger because there's more negative in this interval than there is positive. That is, there are more numbers on the negative side than there are on the positive side, right? And if that's the case, it means the back number was bigger. So we are going to say that they're equal, but we're going to say it's also possible that B is bigger. So I'm going to say that B is either greater than or equal to A, and that allows for the possibility that A and B are the same, but still shows you that in the sample data, the mean for B was bigger than the mean for A. So that's basically it. We're going to look at the set of output, and we're going to make all these little decisions based on the intervals, and then from there, we're going to come up with a statement at the end. Um, there are problem videos devoted to this, so we're really going to take um, that detail and cover it in those problem videos. So that's just a little introduction to the idea that we talk about more in the problem set videos, but basically that's an overview of why we do multiple comparisons, and of course, how we actually interpret the output from a computer. And that 
part of it will be covered in more detail in the following videos.